Hi, my name is Ron McLean. I'm here as an author today, and I'm also here to talk about my favorite book, Marilyn Robinson's novel, Housekeeping. My name is Lucy. I'm a sophomore, and my favorite book is The Odyssey. Guys, get the book in your hand. You have three minutes with that book. Hi, I'm Annette. Um, I picked the book Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. Final. Um, so things can, can kind of change. Uh, I'm Noah Benjamin. I'm a senior. And uh, my favorite book is Walden by Henry David Thoreau. I'm Elena. I'm a sophomore. My favorite book is Prep. <laughs> Hi, I'm Derek. Uh, and this is my favorite book, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, just think a little bit. And when I was in graduate school, I had this wacky experience where I saw a woman on Oprah Winfrey. You know, it was back when Oprah started doing her book club, and I really liked her, and I started reading her books, and I heard she was leading a trip to ancient Greece. And I'd never done anything like this before, but I wrote her a letter and said, do you need an assistant? And she called me. It's a great poet named uh, Charles Bukowski, who was sort of uh, instrumental in my writing. Um, but I think it was seven years from sort of the beginning of the first one to the end of the last one. And, uh, but not seven years of full time. Right, so I, when I was uh, in San Francisco, I really sort of, uh, it was kind of the, uh, the early stages of the mobile boom and the social media boom with Facebook and Twitter just taking off. And um, so I got really interested in the society, the impact on society that technology was having and started writing about that more. And, um, and uh, really, I mean, there, so the opportunity happened, there was a job opening at the Globe to cover technology and to write about that sort of stuff. So that's what drew me to that. I mean, honestly, the day-to-day -day stuff that I have to do is pretty boring, but it's like the story in today's paper about a company that raised a bunch of money. But the good stuff is, you know, trying to figure out uh, what the fact that everyone has a smartphone here is doing to the way we communicate, our privacy issues. I mean, you all are being tracked. Uh, everywhere you go, every every tweet you make, every Facebook post you make, somebody is collecting that data on you and selling it, and we just don't even know what the implications of that are really. Especially because you guys, I mean, you're basically putting your entire your entire life is going to be online. So just think about when you go to your employer and they can just type your name in and figure out what you put online back in you know 2005 or whatever. You know, thank God that stuff that I was writing about when I was in high school is gone. And I can't find it anywhere. So, um, I don't know, I, I'm just sorry. Well, he was just asking about embeds. You know, does everyone know what that means, an embed? So an embed is, uh, especially during the height of the Iraq war and in Afghanistan, there, we would send reporters in, oftentimes our reporters are the monitors, that would, that would basically follow along the Army, uh, you know, go on their operations and uh, live with them and write about them. And it was pretty common practice during the Iraq War. Um, I've dealt with lots of reporters who were on embeds, and it still happens today, but less and less because there's you know, the Iraq war is uh, essentially over, uh, at least our involvement. And then in Afghanistan, it's dwindling. But you also have, you still have embeds, and then you have people who are going in and embedding with insurgents, which is, I know, it's crazy. But, uh, so in, in like Syria, for instance, you'll probably have reporters going in and embedding essentially with the, the rebel officers. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how I got to be a writer. Um, I started out actually in journalism, and I think um, maybe some of you guys are interested in journalism or maybe write for the student paper, um, and then how I sort of segued into writing fiction for um, teens. Um, so I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, um, as I mentioned before, and um, I always really loved, it's kind of one of those creative kids that I loved to like crafts and dance and theater and um, I just loved telling stories, um, essentially. And I loved language um, kind of from early on. I um, 
my first short story that I ever wrote, my mom gave me a pink Trapper Keeper. Do you guys know what Trapper Keepers are? Okay, they're like super 80s. They were these bright pink, huge vinyl. Yeah, see, they were, they were the coolest of the cool then. Um, so my mom gave me this pink Trapper Keeper, and that was my like literary journal. I was probably like eight. And I would write um, poems about, I wrote a poem about a ladybug that I remember vividly. And my first short story was about a wild horse named Babbling Brook. Um, and she got in trouble when the field that she grazed in froze over, it snowed, and then the next night it burned. So clearly I didn't understand like the physics of the elements of nature, but I did understand um, that to make a good story you needed conflict. You needed, to make a plot, you had to have some sort of tension or something for the protagonist to overcome. So that was encouraging, although it's still looking for a publisher. Um, so the next sort of encouragement on my way to becoming a writer um, yeah, when I was in fifth grade, we had a um, we had a story contest, and I basically wrote a short story that ripped off Indiana Jones and the New Testament, and um, I won. <laughs> so my my prize was uh, literally a box of rocks. It was a like clear little thing that had mineral samples in it. So I literally won a box of rocks, and that was my first like push to become a writer. Then I got my second big break. <laughs> I was, um, <laughs> I was, um, You have to explain. Wait, Obama? <laughs> you have to explain hipsters. Oh. Hipsters? <laughs> isn't that, isn't that like a national <laughs> <laughs> Is hipsters like a, hipsters does it have special meaning to you beyond the wider world's meaning? No, no, no. Okay. Are you all hipsters? Is that what? No. <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing these days? If somebody calls you a hipster, is it a compliment or an insult? It's an insult. It's an insult. Well, it's an insult. It's an insult. Yeah, because it means you mask what you do with the layers of irony. Who likes that? Interesting. I like that. Mm. I, there was actually an op-ed in the New York Times that was kind of oh, I based think on that. I think it's in the bathroom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Someone hung it up. So, um, you know, I was just like, how dare you tease me? I was so desperate. And she's like, no, I, I swear, I'm telling you the truth. Um, we had a mutual friend we had both gone to high school with. She said she just emailed me and is looking for your email address. So it turns out, this is like six degrees of separation kind of naked style. Um, I had forwarded it to my friends who had forwarded it to the call it, no, to the college friend of my roommate's high school friend who happened to be an assistant to an editor at Disney. So it had just sort of been forwarded from inbox to inbox. And she had read it and really liked it and thought that my voice and the tone of my piece was appropriate for young adult. I don't know what that says about me. Maybe I have stunted maturity, I don't know. But um, they were interested in me writing a book kind of about the opposite, about a girl from the north who moves south. So at first I was like, I don't know, let me, oh, this is my slide. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting my slides. That was me. So um, <laughs> I'm writing a book for Disney. So at first, though, I was kind of like, I don't know. I really want to be a serious journalist, and like, how can I write like, you know, a young adult novel while I'm reporting on war in Sudan? And I just, you know, I, I just wasn't able to like quite yet to like give up this journalism dream. And then I kind of had a moment of clarity, and I was like, if you give up this chance, you are an absolute idiot. Like you don't deserve to ever write another word again. And I wrote my first draft, um, and I sent it in. And um, this is what you get back. You, it's called an editorial letter. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, this is just the first page of an eight-page letter, single-spaced. So can you imagine if you got comments back from like one of your teachers on a paper and it was eight pages long saying, this cry. is what you did right, but here's what you did wrong. So it's sort of the same method that they probably use with you where they kind of build you up a little bit and then they pile it on and then at the end they're like, go get them, Tiger. So, this was my outline for my first book, and at one point I was trying to get the pacing right, which is, you know, the story should carry you along. You should want to know what happens in the next chapter. You shouldn't get bored. You know, it, it's sort of a, a very kind of delicate, tight rope walk um, between giving the reader enough and giving them just a little bit, and wanting them having them want just a little bit more. So, my editor and I went to a restaurant and wrote out all the scenes on flashcards and literally sat at this big table and just moved it around so visually we could see how the story was unfolding and 
where I might need another scene to develop the relationship between this character and that character. So we're really working on more like larger structural issues at this point. I had 12 versions of the first chapter of my first first book. Um, I usually like to bring um, a box of all my drafts. It's about this big, like pages this big. So we're talking about about a thousand pages or more to be narrowed down to a book that is this size. So um, it's a lot of work, and it was really fun to sort of play with um, the stereotypes that those shows reinforce, um, how unrealistic reality television really is, um, and all the sort of backstage producers' um, machinations. But so to research for that, um, it was really fun. And why did I write this book? Because I love to cook, and I wanted to write a book about cooking. And research entailed cooking and eating. And so I volunteered for a while at a cooking school um, in Nashville, where I moved from. And um, the other aspect was finding out about um, TV production. So you end up relying a lot on friends, and now these days on Facebook. So a lot of times I'll just post something on Facebook like, does anybody speak Russian? Or does anybody know about the, you know, um, like, about um, molecular gastronomy? You know, just random stuff, and people come out of the Yeah, so I've been doing, it's, it's about the Romanovs, or it's related to the Romanovs. Um, it was the last, uh, he was the, Nicholas was the last uh, czar of Russia, and his family was killed in 1918. And a lot of people believed that maybe his youngest daughter um, survived. So I've been reading a lot about this, like, Russian history, and. Um, and getting really random out-of-print books off Amazon, and um, it's it's really fun. I mean, the great thing about being a writer is that it basically gives you license to pick something that you're interested in and just totally delve into it. How many people would say they love reading, writing, that whole world is kind of their sweet spot? How many people would say, letters scare me, show me numbers in the spreadsheet? <laughs> How many people are sort of in between? Or would prefer to function in another language? English, yeah. Okay. I am, was so excited when I heard that you guys were doing this because I have a lifelong pitch that reading and writing are how we all make sense of the world. Whether you are a words person like I am or a math person and numbers and that's your world. I have a friend, Gwen, she's an accountant and vice president of this big conglomerate. And we always talk about how, at the end of the day, it's stories that help us make sense of life. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit today about my experience as a writer and someone who puts their embarrassing stories out there for public consumption and entertainment and what that looks like, but also how reading can help you think about, I love you, think about your life and the lives you see around you in a different way so that when you kind of run into a roadblock, you don't think, oh no, life is over. You start to think, hmm, now the story is getting interesting. So that's my pitch. Are we in? Okay. Reading, as I mentioned, is how I make sense of the world. And I think it takes me places I wouldn't go any other way. I was laughing last night. I just read this story in Men's Journal, and I picked it up. It was a story about this MTV producer who got fired. And he's like, what do I do? So he started this nonprofit. He's going to, I think, save Africa. And my husband and I have a foster daughter who's four, and we want to start a nonprofit that like saves foster kids. And so I was reading it, thinking, yes, we have lots in common. I'm just like him. What can I learn? And in the beginning of the story, it opened. Have you guys heard anything about a guy named General Butt Naked? It gets your attention, right? So General Butt Naked, Mr. MTV, flew to Liberia and met this guy named General Butt Naked. And the reason he had that name was because he used to take off all his clothes. He was a warrior priest. He would do human sacrifices in order to appease the jungle gods. And so at one point, ITV says, oh, well, what do you do now? And he goes, well, I just finished my last sacrifice, and Jesus came to me in a cloud of light and said to stop, and so I stopped, and now I have this whole program where I take care of kids who don't have parents. And then it went on to talk about Mr. MTV and some other like nonsense thing he was doing and how he knows all these celebrities, and I just thought, in the middle of this story, I was just introduced to a world of cannibalism and redemption that I wouldn't have found any place else. And this isn't a man's journal. And it made me think about how powerful it is when you have stories to write them down. And you just never know what they're going to make people 
think of. I was giggling about general butt naked. Now, clearly, I'm still thinking about it. Like, I opened this talk with this story. Now, that said, you don't need to operate at that level of sensationalism in order to have a really good story, right? Mostly, a really good story is when someone is taking something very mundane and thought about it in a way that other people haven't, and they offer their thoughts on that. Um, my first tests are seriously incoherent. Like, I don't even know what's going on. It's usually with stories. I don't like knowing where I'm going when I start out, so it's always a process of discovery for me. And then, so I think that the, the early drafts, it's much more about chopping it up and cutting big pieces of it out and then moving other big pieces around to see does that speak to that better, what happens if I put those two next to each other. Um, and then the, the longer it goes, I think a lot about writing at a sentence level and just how writing sounds. And so the deeper I get into the draft, the more it becomes sort of thinking about, you know, what verb did I use there and does that you know, convey creepiness and fear um, in this story. Or um, one of the things I was preoccupied with in this story was like the, the, the rhythm of the sentences. There's a lot of very, very short sentences, a lot of one word sentence fragments. And that felt important to me in the story that begins with a guy basically a fragment of the image of this movie. So trying to get the language to do the work of what the story is about is part of what I ended up doing.
doing some kind of oversight on this company. So a lot of it is just, you know, slogging through documents and trying to find people to talk to you. And, and that's that's really the hardest part of the job. Is you know, with the movies, they think I want to. Right. Like in real life, how. It's hard, right? Because I, I would never talk to me. You know, I, you know the, the, the Facebook mom, I would never want to be the mom on you know, the front page of the globe talking about that. But I mean, you have to, you have to sort of uh, be part, you know, salesman, con artist, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of an arm twister. Uh, in the end, you sort of try to talk up the fact that this is for a greater good and, uh, you know, what you're doing is public service. So sometimes that works, most of the time it doesn't. So to research for that, um, it was really fun. And why did I write this book? Because I love to cook and I wanted to write a book about cooking. And research entailed cooking and eating. And so I volunteered for a while at a cooking school um, in Nashville, where I moved from. And um, the other aspect was finding out about um, TV production. So you end up relying a lot on friends, and now these days on Facebook. So a lot of times I'll just post something on Facebook like, does anybody speak Russian? Or does anybody know about the, you know, um, like, about uh, molecular gastronomy? You know, just random stuff, and people come out of the woodworks here, you'd be amazed. And then, of course, you have to thank them in the acknowledgments. Um, but so I had a friend who had worked on a bunch of TV shows in Nashville. She was a producer and had worked on some reality shows. So I was sort of mining her for details to try to be as factual as I could. And so at one point, I think I was like, I think I really sent the email that said, um, how far away could you hear a wireless microphone and could you hear it in a walk-in refrigerator? <laughs> she was like, I have no idea. You know, you're a fiction writer. Like, make it up. So, um, anyway, you find yourself sort of... So, in this situation, what kind of protection did the journalists get? What they go overseas and what they go over to our country? So, it, it varies. Uh, for all of our reporters uh, at the Monitor, they would go through a uh, hostile environment training course before they would go into any kind of war situation. And, um, and then when they go into an embed, so they would have to have that that training. They would also have to be sort of checked out by the military. Uh, but a lot of times you're kind of you're not you're you're not going to be at the front line of the battle. And you, you will sort of be protected a little bit by the military, you know, the, the guys you're with, the guys and, and women that you're with. So, uh, we, uh, but you know, the other thing is that a lot of people go into these war zone situations with no training at all. Especially if you're a freelancer, uh, you might show up in um, in a place like Libya or Syria, never having covered a, a war zone, and that's that's become a, a real a real problem. Especially as big newspapers are sending fewer people to report, and freelancers are, are going in who don't have experience. Hi, I'm Sophia. Sophia, nice to meet you. Okay. Talk <laughs> Starts out 
um, on a cold concrete slab, a mosque, a mosque caretaker washed the body. A 14-year-old uh, Archon Diaz for the last time. So I mean, uh, Shadid is probably uh, he was one of the one of the best there was, um, and uh, I would definitely try to go back and, and, and read some of his stuff, especially if you're interested in uh, being a journalist. Does anyone here like fantasy? Yes, no? Very good. How about Game of Thrones? Have you guys seen that? You know what that is? Heard it? This is essentially that same kind of fantasy, but for teens. It's at a teen level. Um, the first, this is the second book in the series. The first book in the series is a book called Finnegan of the Rock. Um, and I will say, as you can see, I've read a kind of we have kind of dating profiles for all these books, so this is essentially the appeals factors going on. Um, Freud himself is a character who, in the first book you met him, he was a petty thief, uh, he was a con man, and he was very violent and abused as a child, so he's kind of raised up in a world that's not so nice. Um, the entire universe of this world is a particularly grim version of fantasy. Um, and he gets kind of taken in by the king and queen of the first novel, and at this point he is at their court and he thinks he's found a home for himself. He is, uh, does not know who his parents are, doesn't know anything about his own history. All he remembers is living in the slums of the city that he came from. Um, so he spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to do with himself, and he's feeling very stable, or, or more stable than usual. Um, the other thing that I'll say that's really interesting about this is it has a lot of parallels to the current world. Um, I don't know how many of you know things like uh, what are called the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa. It's how to heal a country after a kind of horrific um, government or some, a kind of conflict that has ripped it apart. How do you make those people move on? How do you forgive um, the people that have trespassed against you? Um, all of that kind of information is in this book. And their initial response is to just say, well, nobody can blame anybody because nobody was in their control. No one had their own mind. So we're just going to ignore it. We're going to pardon everybody. And then we're just going to forget about it. And nobody can talk about the past. And of course, this doesn't work. Um, all of the people in the kingdom need a way to process it. And Bitter Blue starts going out into the kingdom incognito at night to see what's happening with the people and discovers that they all have come up with ways to cope with this. Some of this very good. Some of it very dangerous. Um, so that's the story. And I love it. So she is also a local author. If you ever get a chance, she's very smart, very interesting. She writes all of her books by hand. So this is like 600 pages. Um, it's quite impressive. Um, so it's very fun. Uh, the artist is a woman named Faith Erin Hicks, who's someone I really like. She's always done good stuff. And the author is also just extremely good at what she does. Um, so my other thing that I had to talk about um, was a book named Codename Verity. Um, this is historical fiction, which I know tends to turn people off almost as soon as you talk about it. Um, this is probably my favorite book of the past year. And it is about two very different girls. One is a um, girl who you come to know as Verity. And she is a Scottish lady, so she's a noble woman. And she has gotten sucked into the war effort and at, over time, this is World War II, um, she ends up as a spy. Um, so, as I don't know how many of you know, but there were a lot of women who worked as spies, especially in England, because you could pop over to France and see what was going on. And um, Verity, at the very beginning, has been caught by the Germans. She is being interrogated, and the entire first chunk of the book is her confession, her written confession. Somewhere in sunlight all about to be swallowed in nights of flame and blackout. Maddie landed at Oakway before sunset and shut down the engine and sat in the cockpit weeping. More than anything else, I think, Maddie went to war on behalf of the Holy Island Seals. So, I am a big fan of audiobooks. Um, I both listen to them and read books and often reread a book by listening to it. It all depends on the narrator. This snare is particularly fabulous. Plus, you get to hear the Scottish accent. Um, the other thing I did want to say is this kind of book is one that I really like for what it tells us about history that you know we get as part of a story, as part of a personal story. Um, these ladies, I just have to highlight because I love them and I like to throw in a little bit of history. Um, these guys were known as the Not Texan by the Germans. They are Russian pilots. Uh, they were ladies. They were the only women who were allowed to actually go into combat. They were bombers. 
Um, so they're pretty fabulous if you want to look them up. The number you have dialed is not in service at this time. The number you have dialed has been changed. The new number is... Please note, the new number is...